recording, huh? Yeah. Well, at least, okay. <laughs> Be careful how you answer that. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're, they're not here. It has to be Jerry and Linda. They're in Florida. <laughs> so they, they have to be the smartest people here. So, but anyway, what we're going to look at is a book of James. And uh, the reason I, I chose this book is because we just got done with the book of uh, Galatians, and it's so much different. It's so much different. Uh, then that book and uh, the great Martin Luther, when talking about the book of James, said it should not be in the canon of the Bible. And uh, meaning it wasn't inspired by God. Uh, yet it still is in the canon of the Bible. And uh, at one time I memorized the whole thing, if you, if you can believe that, but uh, I don't, I, I don't know it now, but I know some of it. But uh, so I just thought, well, maybe it'd be kind of a good book to look af at after we went through Galatians and, and to look at the differences and why they are, it's so different. And so we're gonna look at uh, the book of James and we're gonna look at just the first verse today. And uh, it says, James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. Greetings. And let's pray. So, Lord, uh, we just thank you for your word. And uh, we ask that we can apply it to our lives. And we do pray, uh, I think of Vern and having bladder cancer, uh, we pray about that too. And uh, uh, so we pray for him and uh, uh, he's an older man and uh, these things can be very difficult. So we pray for him and uh, that situation. And then we pray uh, for uh, the study of James that we had learned something and apply it to our lives. And uh, I guess I could say, be like him. So. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to do what uh, Carl does for a living. Uh, <laughs> that's what we're going to do. Uh, the James, it says. And I like the New Testament books. They tell you right away who the author is. But who is he? And Carl, you do a lot of that. Who is this person? And so what we want to do is kind of investigate, like Carl investigates, who this James is. Well, the commentaries that I read says that there are four James Jameses in the Bible, and only two of them are candidates for the book of James. And one is James the Apostle or James, the son of Zebedee, and he's a brother of John. So that's, that was one of them. And we find, though, in Acts chapter 12, verse 2, that he is killed. And he is killed, as we read in, in this first chapter, the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. There was a great persecution in Jerusalem, and they were scattered. And during that time, James the Apostle was killed by the sword. It says there, and he killed James, that is King Herod, the brother of John, with the sword. So they, he was killed. And then I, it just really bugs me, and it pleased the Jews. Well, I put down that pleased the evil Jews anyway, that he was killed. So one of the candidates are gone. We, so uh, Carl would scratch that one off. He didn't make the job or whatever. But the other candidate is the half-brother of the Lord. And uh, I uh, uh, personally, you know, I'm a, I was a Roman Catholic. And to hear that Jesus had brothers 
Uh, I mean, to me, these were important verses to find out because uh, you're, you're taught something completely different in the Roman Catholic Church. But we find uh, in Mark chapter 6, verse 3, it says, talking about Jesus' family, it says, is this not the carpenter? That's Jesus. He's a carpenter who most likely got his trade from his dad. And his dad is probably dead at this time. Isn't he the son of Mary, it says, and the brother of James and Joas and of Judah and of Simeon? And are not his sisters with us? And they were offended of him. So it talks about a family here of brothers and sisters. And then in Matthew 24, or Matthew 1, verse 24, and I got that one down here too. It says, as we think of the family of the Lord, then Joseph being raised from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife. Uh, Joseph was thinking on divorcing Mary because he found her pregnant. And that just doesn't happen. But an angel of the Lord told him that that came from God. And he took Mary at his wife, as his wife. And then it says, and he knew her not till she bore forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. In other words, he did not enter into a marriage relationship with her until after Jesus was born. And so we find that there are brothers, we would call them half-brothers to the Lord. And so the final candidate for the book of James is a half brother of the Lord named James, the oldest, the next one in line, I guess. And so there's, this is kind of a trivia question. Uh, what other half brother of the Lord wrote a book of the, or a letter in the Bible? Jude. Uh, in the book of Jude, and Jude says, I am a bond servant of Jesus Christ, and I am a brother to James. And this is the James he's talking about. So both these brothers, half brothers, both Jude and James wrote books in the Bible. And uh, so we realize who this is. And this is what all the conservative commentators tell you who wrote this book. Uh, now we got to investigate farther on who he is, more than just knowing his name and who he is. In Acts chapter 21, it says that Paul went to Jerusalem, and we know the story, went to Jerusalem because he wanted to face his Jewish brothers. And when he got there, and it's a very dangerous place, he was met by James, that would have been the half-brother of the Lord, and the elders of the church of Jerusalem. And so we find that he is a leader in the church. He is a leader, he's an elder in the church in Jerusalem. So that should be a sign of some good character. And uh, right, Carl, <laughs> I can't. Well, then if we go to Galatians chapter 2, verse 9, we find that Paul testifies of James. He said, Paul says, James, Cephas, which is Peter, and John, they are pillars in the church. And now what does that mean? It means that they are strong followers of Jesus Christ. They are very stable people. As a pillar in a building, you certainly don't want that to move or the building will come down. He was very stable in his beliefs. He's very strong in his beliefs. He had a lot of confidence in what he believed. And as if you go in the book of James, he's not a double-minded man. James is not that. And uh, 
as we look at some of these things, we see that he's a strong person, he's an elder, he's a man with a lot of faith and a lot of confidence in, in the Lord. Uh, but what is amazing is that when we go into the Gospel of John and uh, we find some negative things about James, and if I would like us to turn in our Bibles to John chapter 7 and uh, just read, read these stories. John chapter 7, and it will mention James and Jude and the other brothers here. But it says here, starting with verse 1, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judah because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles, which is the Feast of Booths, was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, his brothers, that's now, we're talking about James, uh, Joas, uh, Simeon, and Jude. His brothers say to him, Depart from here and go up to Judea, where they know they'll kill him. So they told him to go there, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing, for no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. In other words, they interpreted the Lord's work in his ministry at this point as being more of trying to exalt himself. And so they say, go up there. If you're such a great leader, go there amongst those that want to kill you. And then if you do these things, show yourself to the world. And then an interesting verse here, for even his brothers did not believe in him. So these brothers did not believe in him. And Jesus said to them, my time is yet not yet come. They would have not have understood what he was talking about. But your time is always ready. And then he says, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me. Because I testify of it that its works are evil. And he says, ye go up to the, this feast. I am not yet going up to the feast, for my time has not yet fully come. When he had said these things to them, he remained into Galilee. So we find at this point, James is an unbeliever. And we have no clue what made him such a great believer. As we studied in the other, the Bible does not mention it. But we know that there had to be a change. There had to be a change in James, and there had to be a uh, uh, change in Jude, uh, because they all are committed now to Jesus Christ. And someday, as we meet these people, someday in heaven, uh, we will meet these people. We can talk to them about when they were converted to Christ. But it's interesting if you go to 1 Corinthians 15, chapter 15, uh, it talks about James there. And uh, so, you know, I just wonder what happened. But we find in, in after the resurrection of the Lord, we find in that he was buried, that's the Lord Jesus, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, Peter. In other words, what did Peter do right before this? He denied him three times. And so we can see that the Lord was trying to uh, uh, bring a relationship again between him and Peter. And then by the 12, they all were scattered. And he, he wanted to show them what happened. And after that, he was seen over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to this present. But some have fallen asleep. And then he said... 
And after that, he was seen by James, the half-brother of the Lord, as if to build a relationship again with James. And we don't know what happened uh, when they all scattered, but he was seen of Jane, James, a special visit to James. And then all the apostles, and then last of all, he was seen of me also, that's Paul, by the one born out of due time. And so we know that uh, there, was, there had to be a great conversion of these men for them to have changed like they changed. And uh, the Bible says that they are pillars. They weren't double-minded people. Uh, they were men of faith. And uh, uh, we can trust James, I, I think, by his character. And I think, Carl, you would hire him. <laughs> so, but anyway. But uh, it's important for us to realize, as me being an ex-Catholic, that there was, there's a different view in the Catholic Church on the family of the Lord than what the Bible says. And, uh, uh, and, and I just want you to know that as you, because I was really surprised when I first came to the Lord and they told me uh, Jesus had a family with, uh, with half brothers and so on and so forth. But uh, the Catholic ch Church teaches you differently than that. And so I want you to know that. Uh, they believe that Joseph and Mary were married, had Jesus, and then Mary was a, a perpetual virgin forever. She still is a virgin and never had a relationship with her husband. And so they, they teach you that. And so you are surprised when you uh, come to verses like this in the Bible. But... Just a side note on, on the Catholic doctrines, and we talked about this a little bit on Wednesday night, uh, because they have made a cult of the Virgin Mary, and uh, uh, they call her the Queen of Heaven. Uh, they call her the Mother of God. Uh, she is pure and one who can be prayed to. And she is exalted above all women and all the saints. And erroneously, uh, uh, they have attributed the name to Mary, uh, the Queen of Heaven. Now, in uh, Jeremiah, and we, we were going through Jeremiah, it talks about the Queen of Heaven there. And uh, I would like us to turn, I, I think this would be the last turn for us in Jeremiah 44. Chapter 44, and we'll start with verse 15. And there's a similarity here, and uh, and we'll we'll just read these, or I'll show you the similarity as we go on. But uh, starting with chapter 44, verse 15 through 23, I just like to read that. And it says, then all the men who knew their wives had burned incense to other gods with all the women who stood by a great multitude. And all the people who dwelt in the, in the land of Egypt and Pathras answered Jeremiah saying, as for the words that you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we will not listen to you but we will certainly do whatever has gone out of our mouths to burn incense to the queen of heaven and pour our drink offerings to her as we have done and we and our fathers, our kings and our princesses in the city of Judea and in the streets of Jerusalem for then we had plenty of food, were well off and saw no trouble but since we stopped burning incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. The woman also said, and when we had burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings to her, 
Did we make cakes for her to worship her and pour our drink offerings to her without our husband's permission? And so what they're saying is, we're not gonna listen to you, Jeremiah, about not worshiping the queen of heaven. The reason is she answers our prayers and she has given us prosperity. And uh, just an example, if you talk to people that pray to the Virgin Mary, that generally is the same thing they'll tell you. She answers our prayers and uh, they won't listen to you even though it's in the scriptures that we should not do this. But anyway, then Jeremiah, then Jeremiah spoke to all the people, the men and the women and all the people who had given him that answer saying, the incense that you burned in the city of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, you and your fathers, your kings and your princesses and the people of the land, did not the Lord remember them? Did it not come into his mind? And so the Lord could no longer bear it because of the evil you are doing and because of the abomination which you are committed. Therefore, your land is desolate as an astonishment, a curse, and without the inhabitants as to this day, because you have burnt incense and because you have sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed his voice of the Lord or walked in his law, in his statutes and in his testimonies. Therefore, this calamity has happened to you as at this time. And so Jeremiah says, this is why judgment has come to you, because you're not following the word of God and you're praying to this queen of heaven. Uh, I, I have a note here from John MacArthur talking about the queen of heaven. And uh, it said here, the Jews were worshiping Ishtar an Assyrian or Babylonian goddess also called Asheroth and Astart, the wife of Baal and of Moloch, because these duties symbolize generative powers, their worship involved prostitution. So there was prostitution involved. And, uh, but we find somewhat of a similarity between uh, praying to the Virgin Mary, who now is called the Queen of Heaven in the Catholic Church, and what went on in the Old Testament. Now, is that the same spirit? Uh, I don't know. I'm not, I, I, don't, I don't know. But uh, uh, the, the important thing as being a Catholic, it, and it's really it is important to call them the Roman Catholic Church, because they took the doctrines of Rome when Constantine made them the state church, they took the doctrines of Rome and integrated them into the church. And so what they did was uh, they took all the saints. So the, the Romans had a pantheon of gods and they did all kinds of gods for everything. Now what the Catholic church did is they brought them in these pantheons now of saints. And if you're a Catholic, you had a saint that protected you when you traveled, uh, a saint for everything. There were, there were saints for, to protect you everywhere you wanted to go. So uh, they have a pantheon of saints, the Catholic Church does. And Mary is their highest and purest of all the saints. And I remember talking to Catholics about, about this and well, she is the closest to Jesus Christ. So you pray to her so she can talk to Jesus and then answer your prayers is generally the answer I got. But what they were doing, they integrated all this into their system. And so now the Roman church has a pantheon of, uh, of saints. And uh, the, the worship of this queen of heaven went on in, in Ephesus. We talked about uh, Deborah there and Artemis. Uh, they had, uh, uh, what did you say, one of the seven wonders of the world was there all around that cult. Now, they took all this and integrated it into the Catholic Church. And, uh, and so that's why it's called the Roman Catholic Church. It's, it really took Romanism and brought it into the church. Uh, they, uh, 
they still integrate things into their church. Now, in America, uh, evangelicalism is, is quite powerful and uh, quite a movement in America. So you'll find uh, evangelical Catholics. And uh, I, I kind of, since being a Catholic, I always watch the, not always, but I, I'll watch the Catholic stations. There's two of them on my dish. And uh, they, uh, they, they use evangelicalism a lot of times to promote people to remain Catholics. And so they have a, one program, it's called, I think it's called Coming Home, where Catholics leave the Catholic Church, and then they come back, and then they give their testimony on this program of how they have come home to the true church. And uh, then they'll take people that have been converted out of maybe a Baptist church or whatever, and they'll give their testimony on there how they have come home to the true church. But anyway, uh, so it, it really gets kind of mind boggling sometimes when you, you ask the question, are some of these people saved? Are they saved? And uh, there's a, now a, a very a conservative part of the Catholic church. They even want to go back to the Latin mass. And I have a relative that's a priest. And that's what, you know, the high mass is the Latin mass. And they're very conservative, but you know where they're at with the Lord. I just kind of, I don't know, you know, and uh, I just kind of shake my head and I, I don't know. But uh, there is that very conservative part of the Catholic Church. They are conservative politically, and uh, they start to read their Bibles more. And uh, who knows? I don't know, but I just know those dangers are there in the Catholic Church. And they'll mix all this stuff up, but they will uh, keep two points, uh, which brand them as Catholics. And that is the adoration of the Eucharist. That's where they worship the Eucharist as the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ. And then the veneration of Mary and the saints. Those two things is uh, what makes you primarily a Catholic. And... Uh, but anyway, I, I got off of that because, you know, I, I've been Catholic, so I kind of uh, know some of those things. But they, they have a different view of the family, of the Lord's family, than we do, what the Bible says. And so I'll just read those verses again in Matthew. And Joseph, being raised from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife Mary, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. So she, he entered in a normal marriage relationship after Jesus was born, and he called this son Jesus. So, so that's, as we think of James, he is the half-brother, and uh, believe me, in Jude, they all have a different perspective of being raised with the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, they, they will really have a different perspective than uh, the other apostles. They never were there. As we know that within a family, there's rivalries, there's fighting and all those things. And they, they know how the Lord Jesus Christ reacted to all those things. But anyway, when we... We looked at James. He is a leader in the church in Jerusalem, and uh, he remained there even though they were scattered. They were dispersed. He remained there, and uh, so we know he was a very, very much a pillar. And then we we see that Paul came there to visit when he wanted to face the Jews because they hated Paul. Uh, Paul, the only way Paul escaped from Jerusalem was proclaiming that he's a Roman citizen. That's the only way he got out of there. And even then he was darn near killed for it. But we know that uh, uh, James remains there. And as we think of his character, Josephus, a jo Jewish historian, you know what he said of James? He was martyred in AD 62. 
So he even died for the Lord. He was that strong of a man. And uh, he had great confidence in who Christ was. And uh, so for all eternity, when we see James, he'll be honored as a martyr of Jesus Christ. So that'll be good to see him. But then uh, in the Council of Jerusalem, which we studied in the book of Galatians, that is the first council when they came together to find out if circumcision was part of salvation and the law was part of salvation. In the book of James, it's not talked about. And so they claim it's a reliably, the book is reliably dated before that. So James never talks about it. So they figure the dating of the book is from 44 AD to 49 AD. And that makes it the earliest letter in the New Testament. So it's the earliest letter. Uh, and so that, that can explain to us why some of the, like grace is not talked about in, in the book of James. Uh, uh, well, we know the rapture isn't talked about there. Uh, uh, salvation by faith is really not talked about there. Uh, we, can, we now can kind of understand, since it's the earliest book, guess what? He did not know those things. And God will use his other servants, like the Apostle Paul, to explain the church, which the church is not talked about in the book of James. He will use these other brothers to explain those doctrines. But one thing is we think of what James did not know, and, and I think... This is the point I guess I wanted to make uh, in this whole thing is that James and Jude maybe didn't know a lot of the, the doctrines of the church of grace and so on, but they understood who Christ was and is. Uh, they were raised with him. They had a whole different perspective, but they knew who he was. And... Uh, as we, we think of that, they knew that Christ was God in the flesh. I believe they had great confidence in that. As we look at the book of Jude, he does not say, I am a bondservant of God. He doesn't even say that. He says, I am a bondservant of Jesus Christ because he knows who Christ is. He is God that came in the flesh. And same with James. He does associate God. He says, I'm a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he equates them both together and exalts the name of Jesus Christ. So as we think of these men, James and even Jude, they knew who Christ was. They knew it. They were raised with him, and now they, they know it. And uh, uh, they could call them, the Jews could call them blaspheming for putting Christ exalted that high, but they did it anyway. Uh, they knew the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. God has come into the flesh. And uh, as we begin to look at the book of James, I want you to see that first and even go to the book of Jude. I want you to realize that their confidence was that Jesus was God come in the flesh. And uh, they begin their book that way. And they were pillars in the church of God. So let's just close in prayer with that. Lord, uh, we thank you uh, for your words and help us to, to be pillars in the church. Help us not to be double-minded men, as James says, but be pillars and strong and confident in you. And Lord, we do, uh, I think of Vern now, and I'm, I'm not sure if I prayed for him before, but I pray for him in his, uh, his battle with cancer. And we just ask that you would be with him as he's all alone. And uh, so we pray for him. And we just thank you for this time and for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.